I probably should stop buying sauna books. Christopher Rice Hi, this is Julie, and welcome back to the Sauna Trail podcast. Join us in our adventures as we share the story of how our family discovered the world of Finnish sauna. You might be wondering why would anyone do a podcast dedicated to something as commonplace as sauna? It's like doing a podcast about coffee mugs, paint, or chairs. Well, if you stick around, you might find out that there's more to sauna than you realized. Last episode, we shared about how we started making community connections in the online sauna world. Even though we were meeting other sauna enthusiasts on the internet, we didn't have any sauna friends in our geographical vicinity. At this time, the majority of our sauna education came from the books that Christopher was slowly, or not so slowly, collecting, and also from videos that he found online. The first real sauna we used was at a vacation rental, and they had two sauna books at the rental. We didn't even know that sauna books existed. And now we have our own little sauna library that pretty much fills up a small bookshelf. Today, we'll review the history of notable English language sauna books, give you an overview of the different categories of sauna books, highlight a few unique or odd ones, share some of our favorites, and even read some excerpts. If you're someone who likes to go deep and get geeky, this episode is for you. Since we're talking about books, what is everybody reading, even if it's not related to sauna? Yeah, for English right now, Nala and I, well, we just finished reading Antigone, which is a Greek tragedy, a play. Yeah, now we're reading Twelfth Night by Shakespeare. Right now I'm reading a biography about Blaise Pascal for school. Right now I'm reading a book about the canon of scripture. That sounds deep. I'm reading, well, there's several books I'm in the middle of, but the one that I think I'm reading the most right now is called Leadership Jazz, a book about leadership. And I don't know if I have any really active books right now. There's a couple audio books that are kind of stalled out, one by Rosaria Butterfield and then another one by Dostoevsky that I need to finish. Cool. Let's start with a brief history of English language sauna books, focusing on the first few decades after sauna became popular in North America and worldwide. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, sauna caught on as a health and fitness fad. This graph on the screen shows mentions in U.S. newspapers, and it illustrates the meteoric rise in popularity in the early 60s. There were a few blips of coverage before the 60s, and those were probably around the Olympics, where Finns brought and set up saunas at the Olympic Games and garnered some press. This explosion of interest resulted in saunas being added to gyms, hotels, boardrooms, spas, pools, and homes. The fad peaked in the 70s and slowly diminished until we were left with lots of cedar storage closets, and many hotel and gyms even removed their saunas. But I digress. If you want to know more about what happened with the rise in popularity and then decline in North America, I dive deeper into this history in episode five, which is titled, not surprisingly, What Happened? Now back to the books. Let's review a few notable examples. One excellent book published before the explosion in popularity was H.J. Vicariuri's Sauna the Finnish Bath. It was first printed in the early 1950s and is probably the first real English language sauna book. Vicariuri helped found the Finnish Sauna Society two decades prior. The 1965 edition has an excellent foreword by Cecil Ellis, who owned a successful sauna business on the East Coast. Sauna the Finnish Bath is a top-notch introduction to sauna. The next significant book wasn't published until 1963. 
Saul Chalmer Olin, a writer and historian from Fair Harbor, Ohio, was quick to capitalize on the explosion in popularity of sauna in the early 60s. He was well situated to do this because he was Finnish. The title of his book, Sauna, The Way to Health, was probably chosen because it resonated with the American desire for magical, easy health fixes. But the text is way deeper than the title makes it sound. It is an amazing snapshot in time of sauna in the early 1960s, with topics like the history of sauna, health and physiology, a geographic survey of sauna popularity, a list of sauna companies, examples of saunas, and architecturally interesting saunas. It is full of photos and illustrations. We highly recommend this book. The next book we're going to highlight is titled The International Handbook of Finnish Sauna, which was written by two South African architects in the early 70s. Their names were Alan Konya and Alwyn Berger. This book provides in-depth construction information that is still referenced today. Konya even consulted the Association of Finnish Architects to make sure he got things right. He passed away in 2021, but I had the opportunity to speak with him on the phone a few years prior to his passing. I did not know that. Really? Yep. I emailed him and he was gracious enough to let me give him a call in England and we chatted about his sauna stuff, how he got into sauna. I wish I would have taken more notes, but I highly recommend his book. Wow, I don't even remember that. That's pretty cool. In 1974, the Sixth International Sauna Congress was held in Helsinki, Finland. Two years later, the papers presented at that congress were published as a book titled Sauna Studies. It contains almost 300 pages with topics of building, technology, culture, and medicine. The next book we are highlighting is photographer Mikkel Olin's 1978 Sweat. It isn't solely sauna focused, but explores many sweat bathing traditions from around the world. It's really difficult to find, and we don't even own a copy of it. An updated version is now available as an ebook. Our next book was written in 1979 by Bernard Hilila, who was a Finnish educator, pastor, and poet in North America. By the time the late 70s rolled around, sauna had enjoyed almost two decades of extreme popularity, and Hilala recognized that Americans had mistranslated his beloved practice. So he penned The Sauna Is as a way to clarify and re-emphasize the cultural and bathing aspects of sauna. This would have been a great educational resource for Americans to learn about sauna if it had been printed in the 1950s when sauna was first introduced. It's relatively short and easy to digest, but deceptively profound. Then in 1981, Bert Jalasja, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, published The Art of Sauna Building, which was one of the two sauna books that was on the shelf at the first sauna we used. It is full of building guidance and specifications. The other book was Johnson and Miller's The Sauna Book, which was published in 1977. Kai Bremer created one of the first photocentric representations of sauna in 1986's The World of Sauna. The text of the book was crafted by journalist Antero Rivori. The world of sauna presents a picture of sauna in all aspects of Finnish life. Rural, urban, family, hunting cabin, construction, and more. In 1993, an architect from central Finland, Risto Vule Apiala, published Smoke Sauna. It was the first English language book to describe what the original sauna is. A smoke sauna, or savu sauna, had a giant pile of rocks instead of a metal wood-fired stove. It was usually a log building and took several hours to heat. You can hear more about savu saunas in episode 7. Sauna exists, therefore I am, 
is a rather unique and impossible to find sauna booklet written by Bush philosopher Berti Ratti, which was published in 1999. He was an interesting thinker and capable writer, which is why we are highlighting his book. We'll put a link to an abridged PDF in our show notes. This brings us to the 2000s, where we will only highlight two books, but there are many more good ones. Sweating with the Finns, Sauna Stories from North America, is a book that was published in 2005. It was actually the first sauna book that we received. It's a compilation of stories that was put together by Thunder Bay Historical Society. It was actually a writing competition put on by the Finnish American newspapers. The image on the cover of this book is actually a painting, and it's hung up in Kangas Sauna in Thunder Bay. And the final book is 2010's The Opposite of Cold, which is one of our favorites. It's a coffee table style book that combines the excellent photography of Aaron Hautula with an overview of the history and practice of sauna in the north woods of North America and also some in Finland. And the text was written by Michael Nordskog. Michael even consulted the Maddie Kaup's archive. He was a geographer that worked at the University of Minnesota in Duluth. And we'll actually talk about those archives. They're pretty cool in a future episode, so stay tuned for that. This book, The Opposite of Cold, is really kind of a spiritual successor to Bremer's book, The World of Sauna, which we talked about earlier. The only difference really kind of being that it has a North American focus. So that's a brief chronological overview with just selected highlights, but you could also view the world of sauna books through a topical lens. And these are a few of the major topics and some examples. We'll post a visual document with these different categories over at our local page, so watch for that. Now, before we get into the categories, I have a question for each of you. If you were to write a book about sauna, what would be the topic or the focus of your sauna book? I would probably do one with a focus on the social part of sauna and maybe some stories about people we've introduced to sauna or people getting introduced to sauna. I think it might be interesting to do a book exploring sounding during different seasons of the year and times of day. I would probably write a book about how to build a sauna. I think I'm probably similar to Becca. I love the stories of sauna, so I would probably write a book about meaningful sauna sessions that I've had with people. Yeah, and along those lines, it would be cool to read a book that was just people's first experience with saunas. That would be cool. I would do a book about pictures of saunas. I don't know where the saunas would be or anything, but pictures. Cool. I like it. So let's just dive in and go through real quick kind of these different topics, the different categories of sauna books. And again, there's probably a hundred different ways you could categorize them. So this is just my quick and dirty attempt to do so. Um, Some books would fall under the category of general overviews. This would be like Bernard Hilala's The Sauna Is, or V. Herr Yuri's Sauna, The Finnish Bath, or even S.C. Olin's Sauna, The Way to Health, books that maybe dive into the history a bit, the practice a bit, constructing, and just kind of hit all all sorts of different topics about sauna that give you kind of a, a big overview. And then another category would be culture and stories like David Salmala's Sauna's book, which has short stories, poems, illustrations, and photographs, or Jane Pirto's Sauna Poems, or Sweating with the Fins, which we mentioned, or Garrett Conover's Sauna Magic book, where they highlight different people and tell different stories. Um, 
health-focused books, and there's a few of those out there, or architecture-focused books, uh, and a couple examples in the architecture category are vias and saunas in Finland, or Finnish summer houses, or even there's a Minnesota architect, David Salmala, and he has a few books out that showcase his his buildings, but also have saunas in them because he's a Finnish architect. And that's different from David Salmala, the author. They're two different names. I mean, two different people. Yep. Then there's regional focused books like The Opposite of Cold, which it's kind of a general book, but has a focus on the North Woods area in, in the United States, in Canada. Also, there's a book called The Sauna in Central New York, which, as you might guess, focuses on the sauna in Central New York. Shocking. And the sauna, the Finnish sauna in Manitoba is another book about sauna in Canada. And there's a book called Barns, Saunas, and Outhouses that talks about all of those structures specifically in the Republic, Michigan area, which is in the middle of the UP. Which we've been there. We'll talk about that in a future episode. And Breakfast at the Hoito, when the Hoito is a restaurant that was open in Thunder Bay. And then there's also books about sauna in Russia, Norway, Germany. They might call their version of sauna something different, but a lot of those practices are essentially the same thing as sauna. And then there's construction and technical books like Alan Konya's book, and he's published his a few different times under a few different names, but it's the one we talked about earlier, the International Handbook of Finnish Sauna. The Art of Sauna Building by Bert Yalas Ya, or the American, what Americanized ways to pronounce it is Jalas Ja. And there's Finnish Sauna Design, Construction, and Maintenance that's put out by the Finnish Building Center, and they've got a few different editions of that but those are a little difficult to track down and can be kind of expensive. But that's official sauna building information. And then the, a newer one, The Secrets of Finnish Sauna Design, was written by Lassi Likanen. And that one does a good job of synthesizing kind of more modern perspective as well as with Konya stuff and the Finnish Building Center. Um, there's a book called Kiwas, which is the Finnish word for sauna stoves, and it's all about Finnish sauna stoves. And the sauna by Rob Roy, which focuses on cordwood construction. And then Daniel, along the lines with what you said, there's a category of books that I call like a visual feast. They really focus on the, the picture part of it. The opposite of cold would be one of those. Um, Kai Bremer's book, The World of Sauna. And then a couple others that we haven't mentioned yet. There's one called Sauna Bastu by Kenneth Miko. And that's a black and white book. It's kind of like a photo essay. And it really captures like the dark, hot environment of the sauna. It, it's pretty unique and really well done. And then there's another one called Sauna by Viola Vertamo that also is mostly image-centric and our last category would be just like random and special topic books. There's a mobile saunas book by Carlos Collins. And there are a couple actually kids themed sauna books. The Best Part of a Sauna by Cheryl Peterson and Kelly Dupree. And then David Salmola's book was illustrated by Joyce Koskenmaki. And this is a kid's book called The Sauna. And it's really well done, really well written, and really nicely illustrated. So if you're able to track down a copy of that one, I highly recommend it. There's a book that's pretty good that's called The Finnish Sauna, The Japanese Furo, The Indian Anipi, which compares and contrasts those different sweat bathing traditions. There's two books called The Sauna Cookbook, one that was written by Tula Kaitila and Ede Saarinen, and then a more recent one that was written by Vori Mpelkala. And there's books about cold water swimming, and then also 
books that aren't completely focused on sauna, but have a chapter that's really well done, and it's about sauna. So two of these that come to mind are Kasky Stinnett's Grand and Private Pleasures, has a book about him going to use a sauna out in the Finnish countryside, and Sigurd Olsen's Runes of the North, which is set in northern Minnesota and does a really good job of presenting his personal sauna up in the Ely area. Okay, that's a lot of books. And that is probably not even close to all the books that we have that we didn't even mention. Christopher, if you could only have a couple sauna books... Which ones would you say are the ones you would choose? Can I have 10? No, five. Only five? five. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I know. It's going to be hard. Well, I'd probably go with the opposite of cold because it's a great combination of the visuals of sauna, but also the history. So we've gifted that one a few times because it's such a good introductory book. It's, it is very good. And then probably Bernard Hilala's The Sauna Is, as far as like the text goes and presenting what sauna is, like the heart and soul of sauna from a Finnish perspective, his is really well done. And then probably Sweating with Finns, that's full of all those stories. And Sauna The Way to Health by S.C. Olin, Saul Chalmer Olin. It's just so dense, and it's just like a little time capsule of what sauna was in the 60s and before. So mm. before it became super duper duper popular. And then probably one of the, the final ones is going to be a construction book, either Konya's book or Likanen's, uh construction book, one of those two. And that would round out my five books. Okay, so we, we said that we would probably read some excerpts. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, just a few from some of our favorite ones. So the first one is from The Opposite of Cold. And Hudson is going to read a passage about a gentleman named Fred Hall, who grew up in northern Minnesota. And he incorporated sauna into his logging operations that he ran in the 1930s. Soon, Hall began to run the operation himself, as he would throughout the 1930s. Major hauling could only be carried out on ice roads in the winter, and buildings had to be relocated every two or three years on skids to the next camp. The 120 by 24 foot tar paper bunkhouse had to be broken into sections to be moved, but the 27 by 16 foot sauna could be skidded in one piece. Most of the workers, aside from one Swede and one Dane, were immigrant Finns who came back year after year throughout the Great Depression. According to Hall, you couldn't break a nickel loose from anywhere during those years. The presence of a sauna in camp was taken for granted, and Hall later saw the benefits when working for other backwoods operations. I worked for Northwest Paper Company as a forester as far away as ore in camps that didn't have saunas. One of the good parts of the sauna, it kept away the bed bugs that a guy might have picked up along the way. The camp housed dozens of men during peak operations, and de-lousing was important, if not critical, to keep a crew healthy and productive. We had a very good bull cook. He stayed with us for many years, and when a new man came in, he checked him out right away to see if he had any passengers. Then he made sure he was in the sauna cleaned up. Then the clothes would get a sauna too. Wow, I never imagined a logging company having a sauna as part of its operations, but that's pretty cool. The next reading is from Breakfast at the Hoito by Charles Wilkins. It's from the chapter called The Practice of Paradise. It's a family's memory of their summer camp near Thunder Bay, Ontario. The primacy of the sauna is such that it was traditionally the first building Finnish families would construct on a rural or lakeside lot. They live in it while they were clearing land and put up their camp or homestead, says Arnold Koivu, who for three decades has camped with his family on one island lake near Thunder Bay. They didn't have much room, 
but they at least had warmth and a place to cook and stay clean. Arnold's wife, Ila, explains that during the early years of Finnish settlement in the area, children were often born in the sauna, and they saw a lot of it from that point forward, she laughs. That's where the heat and the hot water were. Isla Longin, who camps with her husband, I know, at nearby Two Island Lake, recalls that during summer, when her own children were young, she and I know would light the sauna first thing in the morning and keep it going right through until after dark. I'd use the water for washing dishes, for clothes, and any sort of cleaning. The men would use it for shaving. The kids were in and out of the lake all day, then into the sauna to warm up. With the cold lakes up here, you can't really swim or water ski much at the beginning or the end of the season if you can't get warm in a sauna. The Longin's son Gary, who camps with his family next door, touts the sauna both as a natural narcotic, guaranteed to put children to sleep at the end of the day, and as a balm for insect bites which, in June in northwestern Ontario, can infect exposed skin with the ferocity of a biblical pestilence. The heat opens up the pores and just seems to suck the poison right out, he says. The bites don't swell or itch at all. We don't often associate sauna with the everyday tasks of life, like dishes or shaving, but it obviously was for Aino and Isla and many other Finnish Americans. This next excerpt is from Sauna, the Finnish Bath by H.J. Viherjuri, and the section is called Plenty of Time. One of the things most needed in the sauna is plenty of time. Nothing spoils its enjoyment more than the knowledge that one must hurry. It is always disagreeable to feel that one can only stay in the sauna for a fixed time because others are waiting their turn. If the sauna goer is thinking all the time of something he must do afterwards, he cannot relax properly and so he cannot enjoy the sauna fully. Far too little time is available for the bathers in many public saunas, which are visited by many people on the same day. Each family should be able to spend at least an hour and a half there. A change of underwear and a birch whisk are generally taken along to the sauna. A man strolling along the path to the sauna in his shirt sleeves, with a birch whisk tucked under his arm, is a typical Saturday evening sight in the Finnish countryside. Daddy always says it's okay to rush to sauna, but never rush away from sauna. I think maybe he was inspired by that reading. The next excerpt is from The Sauna Is by Bernard Hilala, from a section called Sauna Hospitality. In our culture, people often invite friends into the home for a meal, for coffee, or for cocktails. Even one's best friends, however, might wince if they were invited to come for a bath. They might think someone is trying to tell them something. In Finland, however, it is very natural to ask friends or neighbors to come for sauna. As more Americans build saunas, this custom will develop naturally. For overnight guests who may have traveled far, what greater hospitality can be offered than a relaxing and cleansing sauna, followed by something to eat, good fellowship, and a sound sleep? On the topic of hospitality and taking sauna with other people, I'm going to read about such a gathering from Sauna, The Way to Health by S.C. Olin. During these Finnish-American gatherings, it is usually the custom to have one or more sauna parties. I shall describe one such typical instance. It could be multiplied many times every year in other sections of the United States, whenever Finnish people or their descendants get together for one celebration or another. At a large Finnish-American gathering in Nogany, Michigan, I was one of the sauna guests at the home of Mr. and Mrs. John Kuyala. After a Saturday evening dinner meeting in town, the large assemblage dispersed to various homes or camps to enjoy a sauna bath. The brisk chill of autumn filled the night air as about 20 of us converged on the Kuyala home. Boreal blasts of icy air came sweeping over the not-too-distant Lake Superior. It chilled us to the marrow. Jack Frost was heralding the coming of King Winter to this wonderland of the American North. It was a distinct pleasure to enter the Kuyela home and enjoy the warmth of the interior. The party broke up into little groups. Animated conversation filled the room. 
homemade refreshments in a large coffee pot graced the dining room table. The sauna stones had been heated to their highest pitch by the host. Sauna bathers began to take turns disappearing into the basement where the bath was located, ladies first in twos and threes. Between their reappearances, the sauna host would go to the basement and stoke the heater with more firewood to keep the stones piping hot and fever dry. After the ladies had their baths, it became the men's turn. I took my bath with a veteran Michigan sauna bather. He was not satisfied with the ordinary vapor heat. He kept tossing water on the hot stones until it became seemingly unbearable to me. However, I stuck it out. All the while, he kept singing songs in the Finnish language and enjoying himself immensely. While it was not exactly the proper sauna behavior, it was fun. I slept a most refreshing sleep that night. I shall long remember with gentle fondness the wonderful sauna and the gracious host and hostess of Nogany. And the last reading we'll share today is from Sweating with the Finns. This is probably one of my favorite sauna books. It's just full of wonderful stories written in Finnish with English translations. Some of the titles are Home is Where the Sauna Is. Another one is Passing Inspection, Lucy's First Sauna, which was a story about a Chinese woman meeting her future in-laws for the first time and being tested in the sauna by her future mother-in-law. It's quite funny. But I'm going to read you just the beginning of one of the stories, and it's called Sampa's Best Sauna. Blue smoke floats over a remote northwestern Ontario pond. Two migrating geese have settled on it for the night. Sampa is seated on the steps of his sauna cabin, taking a moment in the midst of the puttering it takes to heat it. Once again, he sought to escape here, deep into the backwoods. Only his very own sauna, contemplates Sampa, tens of kilometers from today's hustle and bustle, makes life worth living. Much has Sampa seen during his long and eventful life, which has afforded him occasions to build an assortment of saunas. The Electric City saunas with their partitioned shower rooms and sparkling clean walls, Samba characterizes as mere warming and washing facilities. The foundation of his ideal is the smoke sauna back at his birthplace in Finland. Nearly a century ago, its earthen floor, the huge stone kiwas, and the ground gnomes dwelling beneath the benches had given witness to his birth. This current sauna location had charmed Sampa some years earlier during his hunting travels. Here, a tongue of south-facing Precambrian shield descends into the brilliant water of the pond. In the distance, forests of coniferous and deciduous trees loom in layers as if on the canvas of a landscape artist. Initially, with the aids of friends, Sampa hauled a hunt sauna built on top of a trailer to this site. By now, however, the game has moved elsewhere. Some of his comrades have also moved on, most beyond the clouds, to enjoy a sweeter steam. Sampa built this sauna decades ago. And then this goes on to describe the sauna and then the evening of his best sauna. So I'm going to stop there. I just wanted to give you a taste of what the stories are like they're all written like this just very rich very visual um, very well done and it's like I said one of my favorites if you stay tuned later this week I will actually read the rest of the story and have it on our social media I know that sauna is on trend right now with much of the focus on health benefits but very few of these books that we have talk about tracking your pulse or your blood pressure or mentions heat shock proteins. And back in 2015, there was very little sauna community online and basically none offline for us. We would have loved to learn from Finnish Americans in person, but that wasn't readily available to us. So we had to learn through books and online sources, and it wasn't ideal. However, Many of these books did make me feel like I was taking sauna with Finnish Americans. The common themes of bathing, community, food, laughter, lazy summer evenings, copious amounts of coffee, 
and deep conversations or sacred silences were just absolutely wonderful to read about. The construction and historical books shaped our own sauna build, which we'll talk about in a future episode. And then these stories, they just continue to add layers of richness to our sauna practice. So thanks for being with us today as we shared some of our favorite books and stories. Next week's stop on the sauna trail is at David Samala's house. He wrote several of the sauna books that we have and that we've also mentioned. We're super excited to have him join us. So tune in to hear how we connected with David and to hear some of his sauna story. If you haven't yet, join our Locals community and say hi. It's free to sign up. You'll get regular updates from us. If you enjoy our content and would like to support this podcast, Locals has that option as well. The address is thesoundatrail.locals.com. We appreciate all of our supporters and fellow sauna hounds. Our podcast can be found on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and other streaming platforms, as well as our website, thesoundatrail.com. New episodes release Saturdays, which is the traditional finish day for sauna, also called Sauna Piva. We hope to see you on the sauna trail. 